Thank you. You may be seated. Only has three verses, but it was two pages long. <laughs> and thank you, Kathy, for playing that. It's a hard piece. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We're looking at some very important material because, unfortunately, the world is full of spiritual shipwrecks. Not just the pagans, they never got off the ground. They're still sitting on the bottom of the ocean, never got to the surface where they could run into the rocks. But it's filled throughout history with people who have made shipwreck in their Christian life. And we're talking about all the different types of spiritual shipwrecks. The scripture lists quite a few of them. Many different types of spiritual shipwrecks that people make in their lives and as a result never reach the destination of service that God had for them. We're in Acts chapter 27. We've been contrasting physical shipwrecks and spiritual shipwrecks. We're on part five tonight. Paul is about to experience one of his several different shipwrecks. He talks about shipwrecks plural. This is the only one that we have any details recorded for us. But this is only one of the shipwrecks that Paul went through. Beginning in verse 21. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not to have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer. What a thing to say at that point. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And they sounded, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. Then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern, and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under color, as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. And while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that ye have tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship, two hundred, three score, and sixteen souls. Two hundred and seventy-six people in that boat. It was about to wreck, and not one of them was killed in the shipwreck in a humongous storm, Eurachlidon. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that you are the God who can raise a storm at will, terrify mankind, and even save him from the storm when all seems lost. Father, you have allowed various storms in our lives too. Not merely physical storms, but storms that have hit us on every side. And Father, we know that by your grace, for you are our helmsman, 
and we are safe in Jesus, that you can see us safely through the storms of life, no matter how bad they are. And so, Father, we pray for your blessing upon the message tonight, that whatever we are facing, whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever pressure, whatever loss, whatever disappointment, that we will be made safely through because you have promised it. And so, Father, we pray for your blessings upon this message to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, you recall that when we began this series, this is part five tonight, when we began the series, we talked about predestination, election, and the sovereignty of God in the predestined storms of life. And we're not going to cover that material again, but you will recall it, I hope, because God is in control. God's sovereign. God controls the storms, not only the physical storms, but the emotional storms, the spiritual storms, the physical storms of our bodies, the different things that we have to face, the pressures of work and the pressures of daily life and the pressures of family and the pressures sometimes when friends turn on us, but God is there. And he has predestined storms to help us reach the destination that he has planned for this, for us. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's in control. That's why we don't have to be afraid. Now we talked about the multiple shipwrecks. Paul actually mentioned three of them over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Now you and I would have probably have liked to have heard about the other two shipwrecks, but God didn't see fit to let those be recorded in the text. He just mentions them so we'll know that they in fact happened. So in contrast to the amount of suffering in Paul's ministry, it's only one of many things that happened to him. But he was confident that he was squarely in the center of the will of God. And Paul talks about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll not read that passage again. But in that, he lists the dozens of different things that he had to suffer, including direct opposition from Satan himself. Now, the last time that we were here in Acts, back on November 13th, because last week, of course, was Thanksgiving Sunday. We're down at Marcus Hook. Last time we moved into the most dangerous kind of shipwreck, which is spiritual shipwreck. It's a completely different matter that doesn't have the benefits of the other predestined storms of life that we've just studied. Paul describes it in 1 Timothy 1.19. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. If you and I fail to handle the predestined storms of life in the way that God designs for them to be handled, we may be tempted to make spiritual shipwreck of our lives. If you respond to the storms of life in the flesh, instead of responding to the storms of life in the power of the Spirit of God, you will make shipwreck. Now, the ones that we've studied so far was number one. There are at least seven different categories. Number one are doctrinal failure on the central key doctrines of the faith. That's what we saw there in verse 19. It says, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And we talked about last week or two weeks ago, the first faith is without the definite article. The second is with the definite article. That means the word the, T-H-E. In other words, the faith is that central body of truth once and for all delivered unto the saints of which Jude speaks. It says they have put away the faith. The faith centers around the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ or what the Apostle Paul calls the gospel. And having put away the, the faith, it's, they've thrust it away with violence. It's a very, very powerful word in Greek. It's a deliberate, willful rejection of the key elements of the gospel, who Jesus is, what Jesus did. And that's laid out for us in Romans 1, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's always, as we said two weeks ago, that's the center of Satan's attack. Satan hates the gospel because 
It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And he hates you, and he hates me. And if he can twist the gospel just enough where a person believes something that is not quite right concerning the person and work of Christ, they're lost. Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That means you fight. It is a spiritual warfare. That's why you have been given the spiritual armor of Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. You've got to get it all on because the place you don't have your armor on is the place Satan attacks. If you've got the shield of faith up, he's not going to attack there. He's going to attack if you're not wearing the girdle of truth. That's where he'll attack. Or if you're not wearing the breastplate of righteousness, that's where he's going to attack. He's going to attack you where you're not wearing your armor. We know exactly the point of doctrinal attack because Hymenaeus is mentioned again by Paul in 2 Timothy, same book. Of which things put them in remembrance, charging before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, that's a cancer in modern English, of whom is Hymenaeus, there he is again, and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Now, we didn't go into a long, detailed definition of Gnosticism, but Gnosticism was Greek paganism that taught that the physical body was bad and the goal was to be only spirit in some kind of an upward progression. And so they were saying, well, the resurrection is past already. They didn't deny the resurrection of Jesus, but they said it's all over, guys. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, the very next verse. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And not only is God sovereign, he can look down and see who's saved and who's not. But those who are saved have a responsibility down here looking up. Last half of the verse. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, there are different words for sin in the New Testament. Iniquity is moral depravity. This is moral sin we're talking about here. When we get a little farther and talk about some of the other areas of shipwreck, we're going to see how certain doctrines fit with certain areas of moral depravity. Verse 23, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. And of course, uh, some of you have seen now the first uh, in the series that we're doing on Wednesday evening about pseudo-Christian cults that claim to be Christian but have all kinds of perverted doctrine. And some of those ones that we're going to be seeing will parallel very closely to some of the so-called churches and their teachers that we're going to see in the book of Revelation. So I encourage you to be here on Wednesday because it will tie in very carefully or very closely with what we're going to talk about on Sunday evenings when we start the book of Revelation. Doctrinal error of this type is called the snare of the devil. It says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Puggy's snare. Did you know that one of the snares the devil uses is money? Wish we had time to talk about Puggy's and the snares that the devil throws, but that's one of the ones he throws in front of Christians, where money is more important to them than worshiping with God's people, where money is more important to them than maintaining a integrity in their lives. They cheat just a little bit on their taxes or wherever else they want to cheat. 
We also know something more about Alexander who's mentioned here in our passage because he continued in his rebellion in 2 Timothy. Verse, chapter 4, verse 14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. Apparently, Alexander was quite an orator, and he apparently was a powerful pushem in the church. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and the Gentiles might hear. Apparently, Alexander had even turned him into the pagan authorities because it says that by me the preaching might be fully known, all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Just remember, heretics and apostates can be vicious. The second area is not merely doctrinal, but it's moral failure. And we looked at verse 19 a couple minutes ago. Now let me read it again. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand as sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's the word that means moral depravity. Iniquity is moral sin. All the normal forms of sex outside of marriage, as well as all the perverted forms of sex that are forbidden in all circumstances. Paul goes on and expands the reason in the next verse. Keep away from moral sins if you want to be a clean vessel and if you want to be used by God. Verse 20, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself, that means to clean yourself up, get clean, take a bath, and here it's spiritual, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. If you didn't get it, then he gives it to you again in verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace. In other words, it's not just negative, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. But he's saying, here's the way that you fill the void. Fill your life with righteousness, with faith, with charity, that's agape love. That's God's kind of love. Peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. You're focused on purity. The third area of spiritual shipwreck that we talked about were the seven deadly sins. That's very natural in this progression that we see. And I asked you two weeks ago if you could list the seven deadly sins. Some of you got some of them. Gluttony, sloth, greed, wrath, lust, envy, and pride. We find over in Romans chapter 1 that Paul also talks about some of the perverted forms of immorality. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God gave them up to uncleanness. Did you know that that fits evolution? They've decided to get rid of the uncorruptible God and now they think of creation as their creator. And the four-footed beast says the things that led up to us. And so they have this neo-pagan world view of we've got to take care of all of these creatures more than we have to take care of unborn babies. God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own heart to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. That's precisely what God does with the people who reject him in the way that we see here in Romans. And that's happening in America. God gave them up to their vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men leaving the natural use for the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves. They had STDs back then, venereal disease. Receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, God's paying them back, which was meat, that is, it's fitting. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. 
being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. It's in that list, folks. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. That's the kind of affection that parents have for their children and children have for their parents implacable, unmerciful, who, knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. We don't have to guess what God thinks about those things. God says every one of them is worthy of the death penalty. They not only do the same, but they have pleasure in them that do them. I think that gives us a very clear warning that any sin that we stubbornly refuse to confess and from which we stubbornly refuse to repent is like a perverse jammed rudder that always ends our ship on the rocks of destruction. God says the death penalty is the wages of sin, but why will you die? God gave that specific question to Israel. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby you have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit, for why will you die, O house of Israel? In 30, chapter 33, verse 11, he says it again, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? That brings us to the new material for tonight. The fourth area of spiritual shipwreck. Fourth area of spiritual shipwreck is temptation by the temporal things and standards of the world. I read you the verses last time we were together, but we haven't discussed them yet. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world... Now, you know, we need to understand the last phrase in this verse. Most Christians don't get it. If any man love, love the world... Here it is. The love of the Father is not in him. It doesn't say the love of the Father is weak. It doesn't say the love of the Father is sporadic. It doesn't say the love of the Father is there sometimes and there is sometimes not and sometimes it flashes through and sometimes it doesn't flash through. It says the love of the Father, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. I didn't make that up, folks. It's right there in your Bible. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. And he tells you why in verse 16. For all that is in the world, not most, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Yeah, it hits the main areas, doesn't it? Lust of the flesh, those are our physical desires. That hits a whole bunch of the different seven deadly sins, but especially the sin of lust, sexual immorality, but it also would hit gluttony. The lust of the eyes, you look and you say, man, that is a very nice Maserati. I sure wish I had a Maserati. Or, oh, look at that mink coat. Christmas is coming. I wonder if... If so-and-so will get me that beautiful coat. Oh, look at all those baubles. They glisten and they sparkle. Necklaces and earrings and diamond rings and all that. Lust of the eyes. Pride of life. I'm better than you. I'm going to be at the top of the stack. You're not going to get ahead of me. I'm the one that's going to get the promotion. I will undermine you. The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17. And the world passes away, and the lusts thereof, the three things he just listed. The word passing away there is means to be wrapped up in a burial shroud. The world passes away. We talk about people passing away. It's even more graphic than that in Greek. 
It means you've already taken them to the bomber. You've already taken them to the funeral home. They've wrapped them up in the barrel shroud with all the different spices. They're carrying the body to drop it into the ground. The world passes away and the lust thereof. You don't hang on to the dead body when it's ready to drop into the ground. But he that doeth the will of God, what's the will of God? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. That's the context. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. How many Christians, especially here in America, have made shipwreck on the basis of those three things that we've just talked about? You know, it also includes the way in which we deal with other believers when we insist on our rights rather than on our responsibilities. Because that's the standards of the world. The world wants you to demand your rights. I know some people that are very good about that. And they will drive you nuts if you don't give them their rights. And some of them will take you to court if you don't give them their rights. But you know, we as believers should be focused not on our rights, but on the responsibilities that God has given to us. Did you know that you can be perfectly right under the law and you can still make shipwreck? I'll give you an illustration. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 and following. There are any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? You and I are going to sit with Jesus when the world is judged. I think that's awesome. Do you not know that the saints, that's us. Because he started this book, 1 Corinthians, where they had all these horrible problems, to the saints which are at Corinth. These were saved people even though they were carnal. The first nine verses of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the good things. And from verse 10 of chapter 1 all the way to the end of the book, he's talking about where they have problems. And it goes all the way from the moral problems all the way to the doctrinal problems that relate to the resurrection, which some of them weren't getting, and to the Lord's table where they were getting drunk and gluttonizing at the Lord's table in chapter 11. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world should be judged by you, you guys at Corinth, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? In fact, you're not just going to judge the world. Listen to this, verse 3. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? You know, you're being watched all the time. And I'm not talking about big government, although that's probably true. But it doesn't make much difference. Because big government is under the control of something invisible. There are fallen angels. They're called demons. And they know more about you than you know about yourself. They've watched you from the moment of your birth. Did you ever wonder how a medium knows so much about the people that come walking into her or his little parlor? It's because they're in communication with demons. The word demon comes from da, which means to know, related to the Hebrew yada, to know intimately. And they know you, and they know what your weaknesses are. And that's where they attack, and they attack over and over and over again, because they know that if you ever let your guard down, they will get through. But someday, you and I will sit with Jesus as not only the unbelievers are judged, but as the demonic forces who have harassed God's people through all of the ages are judged as well. Paul says so right here. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. You see, the Corinthians had their tables turned upside down. The people who were really living lives of holiness we're not the ones that were always involved in the fight, struggling to get to the top, and so nobody ever considered them for anything. They're just sort of second-class citizens. Paul 
Paul says, you know who you ought to be focusing on is the people who are serving and living for Christ. Set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth the brother with law. That's Christians suing unbelievers in pagan court. That before unbelievers. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. And here's, remember we were talking about rights. This is the loving the things of the world. Love not the world, the things of the world. All that's in the world, lust, flesh, lust, of eyes, pride of life. Not of the Father, but is of the world. And so Paul is dealing with it on the practical level here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here's where a lot of Christians make shipwreck. Here's how you should respond. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? But we don't want that. We want to insist on our rights. Not our responsibilities, but our rights. That's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 6. The Corinthians were having a really rough ride because they refused to let somebody else get the advantage of them. Nay, ye do wrong and defraud and that, your brethren. Now look what he ties it to. Verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. He's going to challenge them. What makes you think you're saved if this is the way you're acting? And look at the list he puts it in. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, people who commit sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, and remember, covetousness is idolatry, the covetous man is an idolater, nor adulterers, which is different from fornication, that's when somebody is married and you're having an immoral relationship, nor effeminate, nor abuses themselves with mankind, those are two different kinds of sodomy, giving it and taking it, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You say, wow, then who can be saved? Well, you can be saved from that, but you can't continue in it. Because he says so here, and such were some of you. See, they'd come out of those backgrounds, fornication, idolatry, adultery, effeminate abusers themselves of mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. There were people at Corinth that fit all those categories. But look what Paul says, such were some of you, but you are washed. You need to show it in the way that you live. But ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So why are you living like this? You can make shipwreck, folks. He's writing to real believers, these clearly real believers, but they were heading for the rocks. He goes on and talks about some other things. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Are you being controlled by something besides the Spirit of God? If you are, you're in trouble. He talks about food. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Gluttony happens to be the sin of some. Fornication happens to be the sin of some. Covetousness happens to be the sin of some. Pride happens to be the sin of others. You know, you can go through all those de deadly sins. He covers them here. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will raise up us by his own power. Your body is important to God. Keep it pure. The body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God has both raised up the Lord and will raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh. That's the same thing he said about Adam and Eve in the garden. 
No marriage ceremony took place there other than God witnessing it when they had their first intercourse. Same thing happens with a whore, with a prostitute, with a harlot, a slut, a trump, whatever you want to call them. He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And that's why Paul says in verse 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that fornication, uh, committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Every other sin is different than fornication. That's what he said. What know you not that your body I mean, he's focused on what was the problem at Corinth. These were people involved in deep immorality and they thought they were cool and they were fighting for positions at the top in the church. He that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? You are not your own. You do not belong to yourself. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You don't belong to you. You belong to Jesus if you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You can't continue in sin. Paul says it. What, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are not sick to sin, dead unto sin, live any longer therein. The Corinthians had that in their past. Paul says, you're saved. It shows up in a transformed life. You don't continue in sin. Put it a different way. We're talking about shipwrecks. Did you know that it is a lot easier to wreck a boat than it is to sail a boat? I suspect that most of you who have not had any training in sailing a boat, if you are given the helm of a small sailboat and you were handed the rope that controls the sail and you're trying to steer this thing across the pond, that either you would wreck the boat or the wind would hit that sail in such a way that it hits you in the head and knocks you out of the boat. It's a lot easier to wreck a boat than it is to sail a boat. If you haven't learned to sail, don't try to run your own boat. That means your life. You need the classroom instruction before you get the boating license. And you need some practical instruction from a teacher, especially if you're trying to learn how to operate a sailboat. One of the things that's been sort of delightful for my kids, and many of them have taken the sailing classes and the kayaking classes and the canoe classes and all the different kind of boating classes they have down at PCC over at the West Campus. They have 800 acres on the West Campus, part of Perdido Bay, where they actually teach all those things because many of these kids end up on the mission field where they have to learn how to sail a boat. It's the only way to get from one place to another is going up and down rivers in the jungle. In the same way, it's a lot easier to wreck a car than drive a car. If you've never had any instruction, I think all of you who drive had to pass at least some written exam, plus you had to have a road test. And even then, there are still thousands of people who have everything from minor accidents to crushing death wrecks. Even a skilled driver can have a wreck if he makes just one small error. The same is true with spiritual shipwrecks. One small error can shipwreck even a skilled pastor or Bible teacher or missionary or youth leader or seminary professor or some other servant of the Lord. And you know what? The devil does his best to get Christian leaders off course and drag them toward the rocks. He works on me harder than he does on most of you. I hope you can see all those things are interconnected. That brings us to the next major area of spiritual shipwrecks. If you're taking notes, number five. The fifth area of spiritual shipwreck is a combination of doctrinal error and moral sin where the two go together. I mentioned that when we first started tonight. 
There are two churches that are listed in the book of Revelation. One of them had two separate categories of false doctrine that led to moral depravity. And the second one had a specific area of false doctrine that led to moral depravity. So you see the doctrinal error connected to a, an error of moral depravity. The first of those was the church at Pergamos. And we'll be talking about it more in detail when we get to the book of Revelation. So I'm just going to cover it a little bit tonight. But let me read you to, from Revelation chapter 2. In fact, both these churches are in chapter 2, one right after the other. Starting in verse 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which has the sharp sword with the two edges. Now, in scripture, when you see the sharp sword with two edges, what is it? It's the word of God. So the first test is going to be a test that relates to the word of God. Now, these people have got some good things said about them. But they're making a doctrinal error which is leading to moral depravity. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and oldest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. These were people who were going through some bad stuff. It wasn't just that they were fat, happy, and lazy, and they didn't have anything else to do but sit around except talk about angels on the top of pins. You hold fast my name. You've not denied my faith. Even in those days, they'd had martyrs. Where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you. Where Satan dwelleth. This was Satan's headquarters at that time. You know, Satan is not omnipresent. He's not all over the earth all at once. He moves from place to place because he is a limited creature. But he does have a headquarters. We don't know exactly where it is today. Might be in Washington, D.C. Might be in London. Might be in Rome. Good chance of that. Might be someplace else in a communist country or some other totalitarian dictatorship. But this is where Satan was in those days. That's where Satan was living, where he dwelleth. All these good things. You're standing firm in the faith. But listen, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. Doctrine of Balaam. Remember back in the book of Numbers, there was Balaam who actually had communication with the true and living God. And you know the story about his talking donkey and all that, and that's what all the kids know about. But you understand what was going on? He tried to curse Israel three times. He couldn't do it. First problem was he had his wrong, a wrong viewpoint of Israel, and he was trying to make money off of it. But he couldn't curse them. So he taught Balak something, what's called the matter of Baal Peor where the Moabitish women came down to the Hebrew young men and began to commit fornication with them so that Balaam could get paid. He said, look, I can't curse them, but I'll tell you how I can get God to judge them. All you have to do is get some of your pretty little girls to run down there and bat their beautiful little painted eyes at some of those rowdy little Hebrew boys and they'll start having sex. And you know what? God himself will judge them. Willing to make doctrinal error for the sake of money. That's the first one that's mentioned here. He taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Not everybody held it, just some. We'll talk about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans when we get there. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Remember, this was the man, the one who has the sharp sword with the two edges. That's what he says. I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth, which is the word of God. Then we move to the second church where we have doctrinal error leading to fornication. Under the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. 
I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. There's another good church in the practical things. In fact, the works that they were doing at that time were better than when they first got started. That's what he said here at the end of this verse. The last to be more than the first. Verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Same thing we saw with Balaam back at Pergamos. You know, false doctrine always leads to moral corruption. It always does. And we have it here. And besides that, we got a woman teacher. I gave her a space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. God even was going to have mercy on Jezebel. Amazing. Named after the woman in the Old Testament, the wife of Ahab. Even that ought to set them off and said, we don't want that woman teaching. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins in the hearts. In other words, you're going to become an example for the other churches. Because you've gotten into doctrinal error that's led you into moral depravity, I'm going to make an example of you so that it will scare all the other churches. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. When we get to the book of Revelation, that, that phrase and that idea shows up over and over again. You're not saved by your works, but God is going to give you according to your works. Payday someday. And for some it will be wonderful, and for others it's going to be horrifying. But unto you I say, unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this... What's the next word? Is anybody following? That have not this? Doctrine! Doctrine and deeds always go hand in hand. That have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak. Who's behind the false doctrine that leads to moral depravity? It tells you here. If you don't have it, I will put none upon you none other burden, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. That brings us to the sixth area of spiritual shipwreck, which is the temptation to walk in the flesh. The temptation to walk in the flesh, to function not in the power of the Spirit, but merely in the strength of the flesh, what you already have with your own carnal mind and with your own physical abilities. Samson is a good example of that. He was a strong man and he could do his thing and nobody, I mean nobody, could stop him. Until he gave away his spiritual secret and then he got blinded and had to grind for the Philistines. But God has given us a specific way to avoid the spiritual shipwreck of walking in the flesh. Galatians 5.16 This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You have to do something positive. You can't just float through life. You have to walk in the Spirit. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And you say, well, what does it mean to walk in the flesh? Well, he tells you right here in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. In other words, it's not even a complete list of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past. This is not once that Paul told the Galatians. He told them many times before that they which do such things, listen carefully, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
The temptation to walk in the flesh will put you on the rocks. Chapter 6, the very next chapter, verse 8, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. You see, but maybe I can do just a few things in the flesh and, and it'll be okay. Really? You know what Paul says about that in Romans? Romans chapter 7, verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Not some good things. Hard to find them, but they're there. Dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Jumping down in verse 25, he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. We get over to chapter 8. He continues the discussion. You know, Paul talks a lot about the flesh in the book of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. What did he say back in chapter 7? In my flesh dwells no good thing. What did he say in Galatians? Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Back to chapter 8 of Romans. For they that are in the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. He's saying the same thing that John said over in 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. John's dealing with the same problem that Paul is dealing with because it is a common problem among believers. Paul is writing to believers at Rome. He's not writing to pagans. John is writing to believers whom he calls fathers and brothers and little children. The flesh is there. Verse 8. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. I don't remember who this was, but years ago when I was a little boy, I heard my dad preaching a sermon about some famous person. I think he was in the music world because my parents were in the music world who had been a, a habitual alcoholic, a drunkard. And after he got saved, he made the comment I don't take the same route home that I used to take. And someone asked him, why not? He says, because it goes past three or four bars. And he says, I don't want to make provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts of it. He knew the strength of the temptation of alcohol that would pull him into the bars. He'd hear the music. He'd see his old friends in there patting themselves on the back and chugging one down. So he didn't go near it. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. But that's not the only area where there is temptation to the flesh. Paul talks about it in some other things that you might not think of. Romans 16, verse 17. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines you have learned, and avoid them. People are always trying to cause church splits. That's walking in the flesh too. Or Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There you've got it. Doctrine and practice. Doctrine and practice. And people do it deliberately to try to deceive you and then watch you fall and laugh. They'll offer you that joint. They'll offer you that beer just to see what you'll say. They'll say, come on. Come on, come on. Get back into the crowd. Forget that Christianity stuff just for a little while. Let's have fun tonight. You don't need to worry about it. Nobody else is around. We'll just have fun tonight. Shipwreck. Shipwreck. I have three more to go, but I've only got, <laughs> I don't even have time for one. Well, the next one is really very interesting, but I won't even tell you what it is. You'll have to wait, the Lord willing, pray for me to get back. 
Otherwise, you will never know what the last three are. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the power of your word. Your word will not return unto you void, but it will accomplish that which you please, and it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And so, Father, we pray that you will take your word as it had gone forth tonight, that you will convict us of sin where there is sin in any area of our life, where our boat may be heading towards shipwreck, that you will draw us back on path, that you will help us to sail safely, not merely for our own sakes, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. And that also we might be a point of rescue mission for those who are about to shipwreck, for those who are about to drown. Father, once again, we thank you for your word and pray your blessings on it. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for tonight. And can it be that I should gain, number 347, an interest in the Savior's blood. We'll stand to sing all four verses, 347. <clears throat>